Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Campana. I'm a professor of English here at Rice University, um, and I have the good fortune to direct the Center for Environmental Studies and to co-direct um, with a colleague the Environmental Studies Program. Um, we are so pleased to be here tonight. For so many reasons, we are so pleased to be here tonight in our sort of spring series of the Planet Now um, webinars, Conversations in Environmental Studies. What a spring it's been. Um, we are super lucky to have Heather Hauser and Alexis Shotwell in conversation with us tonight. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, and I'm especially lucky to be in conversation too with Clint Wilson here of Rice University, who I'll introduce in a moment um, as I pass the baton his way. Um, a few words before that. Um, these webinars, and I hopefully a number of you are regular attendees, um, and which we're going to continue next year as well. Um, they seek to emphasize a habit of conversation across disciplines, across communities, um, about important questions facing us right now in ecology, energy, environment, and climate, and so many other things. Um, we also plan our events really in conversation with our curriculum, the ENST curriculum in mind. So let's first give a shout out to our ENST students and our ENST minors. Hello, it's good to see you all tonight. Um, or. I can't see you, sorry. It's good for you to, it's, I'm really pleased you're all here tonight. Um, I'll give a particular shout out to ENST314 who are here tonight and I'll say why in just a moment. Um, I'll also say finally, wherever and whenever possible, um, we like to make these recordings of these events available um, free and for everyone. Um, so you can also find those and a link is, is um, going to be popping up in just a moment. You can find our kind of archive of Planet Now webinars available for you please sort of view them. They're fantastic. And we're lucky to be in conversation with everyone who's been so generous as to take part. Um, we also have one final webinar to come. I'll mention it again at the end, April 28th at 6 p.m. What now? Climate and Resilience in 2021. Um, my very fine colleagues, Jim Blackburn and Daniel Cohan, both of Civil and Environmental Engineering, will be in conversation, a follow-up to their um, uh, sort of earlier conversation from the fall, thinking about where we are now, post-election, post so many things, um, post-Texas grid collapse, right? Um, and they had a magnificent conversation about Green New Deals before the election, so we're really kind of getting the band back together um, and thinking through those questions with them. Uh, again, April 28th at 6 p.m. Please register. Please, please join us for that. Um, as I said, I'll be turning things over to Clint in just a moment, who I'll introduce, but I just want to say two things and make some sort of thank yous. Um, uh, Please, um, throughout tonight, um, we've got a lot of questions already prepared for our, for our great guests, but please use the Q&A function um, to register any questions you have at any point in the night, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, and then I want to just say a few words of thanks. Um, the Center for Environmental Studies is very happily and gratefully hosted. Um, we have our homes in the schools of humanities and architecture, and I just want to thank Deans John Kasperian and Kathleen Canning for being incredibly supportive to us. That's also the home for the Environmental Studies program, um, and we're very grateful for the support they give of us. Um, my co-director of the Environmental Studies Curriculum, who has been there throughout it all and from the beginning, Richard Johnson, is the director of Admin the Administrative Center for Sustainability and Energy Management here. Um, and I'm so grateful to get to, to work with him on so many aspects of the program, including planning this series. We kind of put it all together with the pandemic in mind, and we've been really excited about the results. Um, I also want to thank um, the folk you can't see right now who are behind the scenes making sure this all happens. Um, Sean Smith, um, a PhD from Rice University, our Mellon Foundation, Deluvial Houston Project Manager, um, and also the HUMA team, John Waterhouse, Paula Platt, and Eric Granquist. We're lucky to have their support, and we're really grateful for the time that they devote to us. I also just want to shout out, give a shout out to the Department uh, of Modern and Classical Literatures and Cultures who have supported the series this year, um, along with the Humanities Research Center under the auspices of that Deluvial Houston grant from the Mellon Foundation. Thank yous. <laughs> Finally, I'm really excited to be here tonight, not only with our fantastic guests, but also with Clint Wilson. Um, he's a PhD candidate here in the Department of English and a predoctoral fellow with the Center for Environmental Studies. He's been working on and is about to defend, hooray in advance, a dissertation, Toxic Media, Modernism's History of Poison and Pollution, which looks at the prevalence and paradoxes of toxic language in 20th century literature. And he's already published work widely in resilience, environmental philosophy, 20th century literature, um, 
the ASAP Journal and 18th Century, amongst others. Um, that's kind of Clint's very lovely but modest bio. Clint is always very modest. So I just want to say a couple things. Clint is an incredible thinker, a very generous thinker. And I've been, I had the great pleasure to work with him for a number of years now. Um, he's working on just an excellent project about why metaphors are not just metaphors, why we always remember that, to, that we need to think with, um, th that we need to think with and live through media. They're not just outside us, um, like toxicity, right? We are part of that. Um, in fact, we are media. We are certain conduits um, and content prone to permeability. And I think his project does a really beautiful job showing how that works across the 20th century with incredible sort of um, literary readings, but also cultural readings and a real attention to um, the, the collision of environment and racism that we're dealing with still today and that we have to keep thinking about again and again. Um, he is community minded, excellent in conversation um, and a channel editor of Toxic Times. Um, we're going to be launching our own public facing writing website for um, conversations around energy and the environment. And he's the channel editor of Toxic Times. Reach out to Clint if you want to write for that. Um, and I'm so excited that he's done that as well as one other thing. Um, he is a great teacher, and I know that from witnessing that. Um, and he also put together what inspired tonight's conversation, really, which is a new course in the curriculum, a collaboration, really in a conversation with our great colleagues in medical humanities, um, a course, ENST 314, Cultures and Media of Environmental Health, which he built from scratch for all of you. And what we'll be doing tonight is featuring questions from the great students of ENST 314. So I'm going to turn it over to Clint to introduce our speakers and get the ball really rolling. Thank you so much, uh, Joe, for that very, very kind introduction. I enjoy giving introductions. I, I don't know how to receive them. So this is a, a new a new place to be. Um, but I will pay it forward, as it were. Um, so, so very thankful to be part of tonight's event and to be introducing our speakers. We're going to actually uh, introduce them one at a time. So we'll, we'll um, wait on Alexis, who will be going a little bit later on. But but first, it's my, my privilege and my pleasure to uh, introduce Heather Hauser, who is an associate professor of English at the University of Texas at Austin, where in addition to being a teacher and a scholar in 2019 and 20, she was the chair of the organizing committee for Planet Texas 2050, a project designed to meet Texas growing population uh, with a plan for resilience, ecological and social. And I think we can all say that after this last year and especially these last few months, um, is a project that is, is beyond timely. To call it present is uh, not enough. And then her book that had a major influence on me, and I can say for my students as well, because we have been working through parts of it this semester, Eco Sickness in Contemporary U.S. Fiction, Environment, and Affect. Um, it's an amazing work. It was the winner of ASAP, uh, the Association for the Study of the Arts of the Present, their 2015 book prize. And she has followed that up with a, uh, a recent book from last year, Infowhelm, Environmental Art and Literature in an Age of Data. And so to Joe's comments about the, the prevalence of media language and metaphor, um, her work maps that for us so beautifully from Eco Sickness to her new work on Infowhelm. Her work has also appeared in New York Review of Books, Lit Hub, Modern Fiction Studies, The Austin uh, American, Statements, uh, American Statesman, and our very own Houston Chronicle. Uh, I want to say one last thing before handing the mic over to Heather, which is to say that uh, one of the challenges of teaching a course like Media and Cultures of Environmental Health with 16 or 17 different majors represented is the constant uh, negotiation of the way terms are slippery and the way they mean different things in different disciplines and just the ongoing challenge of having cross and interdisciplinary conversations. And so as we were thinking about this event, um, I was thinking about scholars and work that helps not only refine our terms, but at times necessarily blow up those terms. And so we had so many productive conversations early in the semester about sickness, illness, and the porous boundary between the two. And in an age in which sickness and illness are on all of our minds, of course, uh, thinking through the, um, the different disciplinary mechanisms and the different um, ideological strata behind all of these concepts is never more important. And I'm so, so thankful to be able to host uh, this event for my students uh, along with Joe and everyone else in the INST program. So Heather, thank you so much for being with us. And without further ado. 
Thank you, Clint. Um, that was, uh, again, hard to take introductions, right? Easier maybe to give them. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank you very much for inviting me into this conversation with you all and Alexis, and also thank Joe um, for facilitating that and all the organizers uh, you mentioned a moment ago. Um, and so when I began writing Eco Sickness that um, Clint just mentioned as a dissertation in 2008, Certainly the cultures and media of health were extensive and vast, but nowhere near, I think, the exposure we have, at least in the North American context today. And so I'm thinking there of COVID-19 data trackers, like the one I just put in the chat. Um, I'm also thinking of, on our theme of environmental health, I'm thinking of the other than human world. So how we're confronted also with sort of the health of other beings in the ecosystems in which we reside and which we constitute. Um, all of this I think of as part of, um, and more, the vastness of the environmental health landscape today. And that landscape um, that I was thinking about for eco sickness really did inform my ideas for this book, um, Infowhelm, that, um, that Clint just mentioned, that really is examining the abundance of environmental data today. So, I mean, I guess maybe um, unexpectedly, but building off of Clint's comment about defining terms, I thought it might be useful to define some of the terms that I uh, was grappling with and trying to get a handle on. Um, so for me, that concept of Infowhelm was not only capturing information overload, but also the cocktail of emotions like curiosity or confusion or despair um, that this information, this data landscape elicits. And I was interested in exploring that through the artworks that are filtering, are repurposing that data. So people like Barbara Kingsolver, um, people like Indra Sinha, the novelist, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, people like Maya Lin, whom I know Clint has written on as well, um, and photographers, many, many more. These artists aren't just humanizing the data. And I say that quite um, deliberately because it's a phrase I hear a lot, you might hear a lot, when the sciences talk about what work of the arts and humanities do. For me, the arts of the infowhelm were actually reproducing that experience of overload, but as a way to um, navigate data emotionally and experientially. So I think of um, artists as using information as the raw material for that art as uh, of their artworks and as a resource for thinking through how we come to know the environment and specifically really the epistemological authority the arts hold in relation to the sciences. And I wanted, I'm underscoring these points from the book because I think that's essential when we think about environmental health, like who has the authority to speak to the experiences of um, environmental health or sickness. Um, and so I think it's very, you know, I was interested in how or artists incorporate this scientific information really to reflect on those traditions of knowledge that constitute, that, um, that distribute, that are so responsible for environmental uh, modes of understanding and also, also medical modes of understanding. And to me, what's really important is that these modes of not, ways of knowing epistemologies often arise alongside and even directly with colonialist, racist, and sexist agendas, right? That, not, this is not to disparage um, traditional Western science, it's brought us so much. Um, and that's one of the key points I make in the book that these artists are actually trying to pay some deference to the science without giving them all of the authority of knowledge um, and knowledge making. Um, and so my key word for thinking through this in the book was how scientific epistemologies are really mingling with ways of knowing rooted in the body in emotion, in states of uncertainty, in states of um, speculation. And so I'm not going to go um, too much detail more into the book, though I'd be happy to in the Q&A, but I wanted to bring that lens um, actually onto the COVID-19 pandemic in this piece um, that, that Clint mentioned a moment ago in New York Review of Books, um, which I will also try to share there in the chat. Um, I was thinking about how we were experiencing, many of us, a COVID-19 infowhelm. And what was so important to me there, as in the book, is 
that this means that you know data are uncertain and evolving they're contested by those in power and really the stakes of action are enormous so that data is carrying so much weight and i think those of us in texas or with loved ones in texas like all of the those three elements of data info realm are were really relevant during our um the cascade of infrastructure failures right like we might get data one day, but it's contested or its sources is contested by those in power the next day. And yet we have to act now, right? We have to know how to survive for many people, whether to leave our homes. So this idea of like the stakes of data and a condition of info realm really span um, so many aspects of, of our life. Um, and I was interested, like, and I think that's really another important thing to remember that when we are talking about something that is an environmental health crisis, for example, often there are analogies or sort of like crossovers to other crises that they impact and that we can learn from. So for me, like thinking about responses to climate crisis were quite important for thinking about responses to COVID-19. So for example, you can't just say if people have the right data, they will respond in the quote unquote right way. Um, that we need to account for economic needs, histories of relating to racist and sexist science and data. We need to account for the ways culture and identity frame an issue in all respects. And, and we also, I think it's all of those things that are potentially obstacles to how data can move from uh, to understanding and action are also potentially opportunities. Um, and so I, I just wanted to highlight a novel I read recently in this respect, um, a novel called Crosshairs by Catherine Hernandez, um, that really I think highlights how these traditions of um, relating to scientific and um, government authorities can get amplified in, in conditions of climate emergency. So in that case, it's specifically histories of trans um, and homophobic um, medicine and oppression by the state that sort of gets amplified and activated under climate emergency. So this is something like, I think thinking across these, um, what can sometimes seem like discrete um, incidents is really important when we think of environmental health and our relationship to um, scientific knowledge in general. Um, and another big point I think from, you know, my really inhabiting this moment, um, of writing in Fowell, living through the pandemic, living through the Texas crisis, is just how important data literacy is. And it's not like my favorite phrase, it's not a phrase I've used in the book, but it, it'll be handy for now, right? Um, to be reminded that even when we're getting information through so-called objective or instrumental media, that is you know, a data visualization from the IPCC or a data visualization on your dashboard for your local government about COVID, that these are, um, these themselves are interpretations and they are themselves open to cultural interpretation. So um, that visualizations of data, whether they come, you know, whatever form they come in are, you know, certainly mediated by the producer's identities, they're mediated by institutions, they're mediated by cultural conventions and the emotions that all of those things um, generate. And I, I was thinking of this, I won't go into this now, but you know, um, visualizations about you know, sort of COVID hotspots or heat maps, but equally I was thinking of you know, the visualizations you see in IPCC reports. Um, so all of these are eliciting and if infused with emotion and um, different forms of um, association that we have to take account for. Um, and I wanted to now, you know, talk about eco sickness, which I know many of you in the audience are reading in Clint's class, because really my attention to emotion across media emerged from this project, but not only emotion, also what emerged from this project is that idea of uncertain and contested data, and also the histories of Western science and how people sort of navigate them um, when they are facing in these cases, um, sort of um, uh, conditions of sickness and environmental damage. 
Um, so this project, EcoCygnus, was much more obviously engaged with the culture and media of environmental health. And I was interested in seeing the body in relation to the environment through a lens of sickness rather than through a relation of like masculine rigor or robustness that you can see in a lot of like, especially white nature writing of the 19th century. Um, contemporary literature was not thinking necessarily about the body in relation to the environment in those terms. Instead, they were thinking of that relation through the sick body. And I was particularly interested in, there are plenty of texts like um, what Stacey Alimo calls material memoirs. There are plenty of texts that think about direct causality between a toxic environment and something like cancer or infertility. But I was seeing a lot of stories where there were non-causal or not obviously uh, potentially correlated. Um, I know causality is always dicey, so a rough word to use. But, um, but there were a lot of texts that were thinking of non-causal relations between the environment and the body. Novels like Leslie Marmon Silko's Almanac of the Dead, or memoirs like David Vornarovich's Close to the Knives. And they were articulating how sickness crosses between environment and body via these powerful emotions that often have um, a long history, long traditions in environmental thought. And these are emotions like anxiety, um, like wonder and um, also disgust. And so for looking at these narratives, um, which were also about infowelm, because um, so many of them are incorporating scientific explanations and information, um, they were incorporating this information, but also challenging the ways we come to know um, medical problems that um, we can't always, they can't always be quantified. Their causalities, their sources can't always be known there aren't always cures. And in fact, I, I don't know, I think in all the texts in ego sickness, there is no cure really. Um, instead, there's exploration of how environments become embodied through these emotions of sickness. Um, and so a novel I wrote about um, Richard Powers, The Echo Maker was really, I saw it as disrupting these easy templates for environmental emotion like wonder. Um, so this powerful feeling around that really constitutes environmental relation for a lot of people, he sort of adds this flavor of disconnection and paranoia, sort of like wonder taken too far and what can happen in that um, condition to really, you know, disturb, help us think through some of these emotions we might rely on to think about our relationship to environments, but how they often have various orientations. Um, and so I see eco as offering ways to read literature we might not originally see as environmental, as environmental, to read literature for and as embodiment, and also as commentary and engines on emotion, um, and specifically how the mechanics of a literary text, or I can extend that to a visual culture as well, how that, that is actually itself this engine for emotion and thinking about how it works. Um, and so I wanted to conclude by sort of going in a slightly different direction, um, but I'm moving into new projects also at the intersection somewhat of environment and health, thinking about climate crisis and reproduction. And I've been reflecting on an idea that really appeared in eco sickness, but wasn't, I don't think I announced it, but it's really been amplified by these COVID-19 disparities and also the disparities um, that many of us in Texas witnessed or maybe ourselves experienced with the, with the um, winter crisis. And that's the idea of the pervasive but differential. Um, and to me, like toxicity exemplifies this idea and it's not a new idea. Uh, I'm not like saying this is a great revelation, um, but this is the idea that things happen everywhere, but don't do so equally. So individual immunity varies, but no population is fully immune to COVID-19 and using immune quite loosely there. No one's fully protected from climate crisis impacts. No one is untouched by toxicity. Yet all of these things, um, they vary wi wildly across individuals, communities, and environments because of these forms of oppression and, um, 
And often because of forms of really kinds of relationships to science and, and data um, that constitute these, these disparate outcomes. Um, and so I just think this fundamental idea of the pervasive but differential is one that environmental health scholars and artists are like amazing at expressing and exploring, but I also don't think we can ever say enough about it. And so I, I wanted to end on that note and um, thank everyone again. And I look forward to hearing from Alexis and the conversation. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I am pulling up my notes now um, to, to transition us. Um, I'm not sure, I think I'm on. Okay, good. Um, to transition us to our next speaker, uh, Alexis Shotwell, Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University, where she's cross-appointed with the Pauline Jewett Institute of Women's and Gender Studies and Department of Philosophy. Um, so just proof in the, in the pudding that we are doing interdisciplinary work tonight in all sorts of varieties. Um, her first book, Knowing Otherwise, Race, Gender, and Implicit Understanding, argues that unspeakable forms of knowledge are not only important, but also vital to the formation of racial and gender categories. So we're already seeing some overlap with some of that early work about questions of knowledge and for the production of knowledge and, and what um, Heather shared with us tonight that you know the way we come to know is one of these key questions that we need to be asking. But my students will know um, Alexa's work from Against Purity, which we've read parts of this semester, Living Ethically in Compromised Times. And, and this book contests, uh, contests the magnetic um, logics of purity for both our ecological and political ambitions. Um, there's a really great interview I'd recommend all of you checking out with The Atlantic uh, on purity politics that Alexis uh, did and was part of. And uh, I think that the way she frames this question is so fundamental, so important as we think through um, both the, the political and the social ambitions that we as environmental thinkers are approaching and how thinking beyond and against, in fact, purity might be a way forward for us toward a more holistically ethical and holistically meaningful sense of environmental health. It is such an honor uh, to, to invite her to be with us tonight. And uh, without further ado, thank you so much. Take us away. Hi, thanks so much for this invitation. Um, really wonderful to be here with you, Clint and uh, Joseph. And thanks to everyone who um, has made all this happen. And hello to everyone who's here. Um, yeah, so many beautiful synergies between um, our work. I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, and so I think I definitely started um, in my dissertation work in Knowing Other, which turned into the book Knowing Otherwise, thinking through what it meant for us to take seriously the idea that the kind of knowledge we have that happens not in words is salient epistemically and politically. Um, and so that's thinking about our embodied knowledge, our presuppositions, our common sense. Um, and really that started and it continues to be um, so live for me in thinking about why we need forms of knowledge and transformation that aren't just at the level of making claims, um, but in all of these other registers. And so this continues to be a preoccupation for me. Uh, we cannot just change people's um, propositional knowledge if we want them to stop shooting people and saying that uh, they thought they were using a taser. So really to be thinking through the like embodied material uh, violences that come with like, for example, forms of training that are given to police departments, not just in the US, but also in Canada where I live. Um, so I've written a lot about the feeling of shame about whiteness, of benefiting from racism, systemic and current, historical and ongoing. Uh, and I continue to be really obsessed with that and I've actually kind of returned to it in my um, new book that I'm working on. Um, but I think because of that work on the, um, the implicit, on implicit knowledge, I really started to think a lot about this question of how we confront wicked problems that we can't even know the full shape of. Um, so things that are so complicated and so impossible for any one knower to understand 
that we are tempted to despair. So there's lots of these, um, and we think about them exactly as we're doing here in terms of um, you know, the environment or the ecology that we're involved in, um, but also in terms of these bigger flows and questions of uh, what is this world and how would we change it? Um, and how would we change it if we stopped thinking that we could stand outside of it and be innocent uh, and be um, pure? So I wanna just be really clear that I'm against purity, not in the sense of thinking, I think everyone deserves the best water and the most untainted food and the best air and uh, worlds in which flourishing is the immediate response. Um, like I'm for um, repair in those senses. And because of that, I don't think that turning toward purity gets us there. It's actually um, this idea that we need to be innocent in order to be effective shuts us down. So in Against Purity, one of the things that I really talk about is this idea that in addition to distributed cognition, so a recognition that none of us can individually know the full scope of the problems we face, I'm interested in distributed ethicality and distributed politics, which is all of us working from where we are on the wicked problems that confront us for a world in which many worlds can live. Um, and really I'm interested in what happens if we turn directly toward that feeling of despair, hopelessness. Uh, what happens if the more knowledge we have, the more shut down we feel? How can we actually reckon with that, work with it? Um, so since, since Against Purity came out, I've had lots of conversations with people and, um, and the main thing that I've discovered is that the vast majority of people for very good reasons that have to do with the ascendancy, continued ascendancy of neoliberalism, uh, lifestyleism, and a sense that we should just um, individually be able to solve things through heroic acts of martyrdom, um, that if we're complicit in something, we don't have any right to say that we think it's wrong. Um, I came to realize that actually it's very difficult for people to understand what collectivity could feel like and how political action could actually be something they could access. So um, mostly these days I'm working on this book that I'm calling Collecting Our People, which is a riff a little bit on the kind of like hashtag settler collector or like white people come in and collect your people from my Twitter thread. Um, but it's also about how do we actually get together with other people? So if we really take seriously this understanding that is true, that we need hundreds of millions of people to come together right now in order to save our world, how are we actually gonna do that? And I don't think we're gonna do it by just making people feel guilty. And I don't think we're gonna do it by just being really overwhelmed ourselves and overworking and um, making tiredness a virtue. Uh, so I've been trying to sketch out and also take some of what I've learned from being in social movements for 20 years now um, for thinking about this idea of getting together, um, collecting the people who we can work with to make change and finding what those relationships look like and what those practices actually are. Uh, so I can say some stuff about kind of strategy and tactics, but I'll just tell you the sort of three kinds of relationships that I've become interested in about um, how I think we turn toward collectivity and away from lifestyleism and individualism and save the world. Um, and so the first one is friendship. So this is the kind of friendship that comes from aspiring to become our best self, the self that only we can be. So recognizing our specific particular, unique situation in history and in the social world that we inhabit. So what do we personally inherit? What do we benefit from? What are we connected to? What do we care about? What, what are we um, manifesting if we are manifesting our best self? 
So for me, that's, I inherit and benefit from white supremacy and I care about changing that. And that's one of the traction points that I have. So first I'm a, I can be a friend to myself in aspiring that I could become my best self. And then I can have friends that help call me in to that kind of work and who I help call into being their best selves. So that's this kind of small thing, but it's really important. We need to have people where we are actually um, becoming toward ourselves. And then there's this big category of fellow travelers or of uh, comrades, we might call it. So these are people that we don't have to be friends with, but we are walking the same path with them. We're walking toward a world that doesn't exist yet from wherever we're situated. So these are solidarity relations that are necessarily relations across difference. So we don't have to be the same. We don't have to experience the same oppression. We can just point ourselves toward a shared world in which we can all live. So that's the second kind of relationality. And the third one that I'm uh, interested in us taking up is uh, naming our enemies. So naming the people that we really stand against and taking that as a form of relation so I'm talking about this in terms of claiming our bad kin. So not pretending that we're not related to them. In my case, claiming the inheritance of white supremacy and going and standing against the white supremacists, the proud boys, you know, when they show up in my town. So that's my, like, I stand against those people not because I think they're gonna be my enemy forever. I think they can change. That's why I claim a relation with them, partially because they're claiming a relation with me. And we could take this in any vector you like, right? So the oil executive who says, it's gonna be okay, we'll just make a lot of money for these particular people and we'll protect them from the flooding, right? Or we'll make sure that you have heat when the grid goes down, right? If you have enough money, right? So. So those people are right now, those are the enemy of life. And that's a relationship that we can stand in with them. Opposition, if enemy makes you uncomfortable. Um, so that's the main stuff that I've been thinking about. And I have another whole set of things like many, many of us do. Um, I did a five-year project on the history of AIDS activism that is uh, completely uh, organizing my entire way that I think about what's happening with COVID. Um, so I'll just finally flag this part, which is we really need to think about treatment, um, but treatment in the sense of um, making it possible for people to rest. So we can't just be focusing on vaccines. We need to think about what it means to have a huge percentage of the world's population, um, many of whom already experienced disability. So I have an environmental illness that makes me sick, you know, various times and various conditions. Um, and when I look around at my friends who've had COVID for, you know, six months going on a year, some of them, um, it breaks my heart to know how they're feeling. Um, you know, and so it's just, uh, AIDS activists taught me that we need to think about um, treatment, not just prevention. And we desperately need that. And treatment means, yeah, changing the world, um, probably abolishing capitalism. So I'm sure we can figure all of that out in the next uh, few minutes. That's all I want to say. Thanks so much for that and for, for the both of those really wonderful presentations. Um, Clint will kick us off in a second with the first of our questions for ENS314, but um, in addition to seeing if there's any kind of crosstalk, you all want to have a with one another. Maybe I'll also just lob out here because it's come up in both of your talks, um, not just that, um, you know, the premises of your work already, but also thinking about this moment. And when I say moment, I mean this stretched 
who keep fantasizing end of or after after COVID, right? Is that sort of what an ambitious and sort of you know fantasy fantasy term that it that that sort of is? As you as you think about various kinds of complex, I guess emergence. Um, I'm thinking a lot about what it is to be or not be overwhelmed. I'm thinking a lot about from these talks too about um, what it is to understand the social differently if collectivity is part of the answer. So maybe I'll just sort of say that and see if either of you want to sort of say anything, especially in response to one another before we leap into our questions. Oh, I'm like now, um, I think just experiencing that question um, more than having an answer to it. Um, but I think, um, I don't know, it really, I think one of the things that really hit me in what you were saying, Alexis, is the, the hero mode as well as the martyr mode. And the, um, the, I think you said like guilt won't do it, but also overworking and tiredness won't do it. And just, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to highlight that because it struck me on a day when quite frankly, I'm wondering how I'm standing here um, and maybe others are as well. Um, but it also struck me in just the um, sort of that, that real conflict I think many of us are feeling between wanting to do the work and feeling overworked and just, ha and, and that spans so many of the things like everything we've talked about and mentioned today. And so I just, I appreciated hearing that like all of those, I wrote down all, sort of all of those keywords, complicity, heroism, martyrdom, guilt, overworking, tiredness, um, and then certainly your, your, your relations that are very important too. But I, I guess I more wanted to strike a note of appreciation and like how all of what you said is sort of also in the work I was talking about and how one does or does not can, cannot respond. Yeah, and there's such a key part of that, I think, also in thinking about the kind of info um piece that, I mean, I do want to be clear that, Heather, if you have the power to turn back climate change and cure COVID and cancer just by force of will, it might be that I would be like, yes, then it's worth you sort of working yourself to the bone. But, but, but what I've realized and this is partially just through, through talking to people who have been doing activism for you know more like 40 years, 50 years, is like if exhausting ourselves actually worked, like it would have worked. Um, and so so if we want to actually be here for the long haul, um, since going to the end of our capacity didn't do it we might as well stop before we're at the end of our capacity. And I and that has been really an interesting proposition for me. And it feels connected to the whole thing that we're doing in everything is like, if we really, you know, if we just really try to think through like, what does it mean? Adrian Mary Brown and Leah Lakshmi Peepsana Samarasina have been talking about moving at the speed of trust. Um, like, what does it mean for us to feel in connection with our worlds in a way that we actually can do it so that all of us are gonna live, you know? It's, so it's like, it's a question, but I think it's, it, it's a constant question. Um, yeah, and I, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead, yeah. I was just, I, um, with the project, the AIDS, the history of AIDS activism, you were, um, working so hard on um, the last five years. And uh, I also see that uh, projects like that cropping up in um, Tiffany King's work focused on activists. Like there's a lot of, I think, focus on thinking about the sociality and the um, also in some cases, maybe so sociology of activist group, but really the sociology of those groups and and it, yeah. I think it's not a coincidence that it's happening in the long now. Um, uh, certainly others have focused on this, but I'm just aware of a lot of um, attention to those communities. Um, my next project, I can, that's a, an aspect of that project too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just thought I was noticing that as also 
an area for a lot of attention for I think all the reasons that you've you've been highlighting today. Yeah. Excellent, Clint, why don't we get us started into uh, some of the questions from 314. And as I say that, also, for those of you in the audience, please, please, please post your questions in the Q&A. We want to talk to as many of you as possible and answer as many questions as we can get to. Thanks, Joe. And uh, yeah, thank you to my INS 314 students who I, I see you all, not really, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the margins, as it were. Um, and I do want to say the first thing I want to talk about is, is that overlap that I alluded to about knowledge and the production of knowledge. It's been a major theme of, of, of our course. We've read a lot of books where that seems to be central. Um, speaking of Sinha, we're reading Animals People right now. Uh, we've read Eliza Griswold's Amity and Prosperity um, about fracking in Southern Pennsylvania. Um, and in both those texts, we just felt like knowledge is a contested category and, and something to use a term from your work, Alexis, that, that is always kind of compromised, um, which is not to say that it's not worth pursuing, it's just partial uh, in most of our access points. Um, and one final note, um, in, a, in a semester and in a year where producing knowledge in, in the college environment is so hard, I'm just so thankful to have so many amazing students. Uh, you all are um, doing things that there's no chance that 19 year old me could have ever pulled off. So um, thank you for being here tonight. My first question, that I'd love to ask. And this can be for, for both of you, although I think that Heather, your work inspired the question initially is from uh, Amanda May, who's on the call tonight. Uh, she says, I'm gonna read her question. Um, and I think you're gonna see some of the potential overlap for both of you. Um, in an effort to stir people into action to create an effective uh, response, there's an abundance of educational material and news that people are met with everywhere they look, especially students right now, right? Uh, how do you think that people can approach these materials in a way that prevents them from becoming overwhelmed and potentially even numb to what they're learning? How do we learn without just collapsing beneath the weight of data and knowledge and what we know? Oh, I would, yeah, I'd love to hear Alexis's response too, if we have time. Um, I think sometimes we do collapse, I will just say, which doesn't have to be a permanent state, but um, trying to avoid collapse might make things worse. <laughs> sometimes um, not to get all therapeutic about it, but, um, but I also think and this is, I don't know, maybe this is too simplistic, but um, being very selective about, and, and I'm thinking of some of Alexis's terms, like your friendships and your fellow travelers, um, you know, it can be easy to think of those terms as, although I know, you know, Alexis said the fellow traveler is not necessarily a friend, but we think, I, I believe we think we have more choice about a friend than we do about all of the sources of information and knowledge outside of ourselves. But I think we do have a little more choice than that. And like choosing your friends um, as sources of information and fellow travelers, I think is quite important. Like. Um, it, it is important also to listen to the enemies, right? To know what, what others are saying. So you're not ignorant, but it's okay, I think, to be selective. It's, I'm not convinced that more is better, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, and choosing those friendly um, information sources, even if they are overwhelming at times, to me seems really important. And to be in dialogue with other people, because I know for me, the one of the hardest parts of COVID, I live alone and COVID-19 is not fun in that condition. It's not fun in a lot of conditions. So I'm not trying to make a comparison, but um, not having that dialogue, I think is, is makes it worse. So choosing those actual friends, uh, you know, uh, that you can be in dialogue with is to me a good way of avoiding a, a more like enduring collapse. Yeah, I think that's so right. And I think the only thing I'll add is, um, you know, the great thing about studying science and technology studies is getting really um, a lot of traction for seeing how necessary it is for people to not think that they already know everything. And just to watch what it looks like for people to be like, oh, the world is completely different than I thought it was. I was sure of it. And now it's totally changed. Or 
it was really like that and now it's really different. So I've been working with this wonderful, I just love him so much, Ludwig Fleck. Um, he wrote this book called The Making of a Scientific Fact, which was about the long road to figuring out what syphilis is. And he does this gorgeous stuff about thinking through like, what does it mean to have a thought collective of people who are asking questions that you don't yet know need to be asked? Um, so having a sense of like, what, what does it look like for us to be like, we're never gonna be perfect with our knowledge and that's fine, that's great. That's actually so necessary. I think um, it's very helpful because then you don't feel like, oh, I'm just uh, useless here, right? Because I got it wrong. Instead you feel like I got it wrong and someone was kind enough to point it out to me. Um, so it's never, I think especially when you've been really sure of something and then you were wrong, that's not an easy space. Um, but I think that there's something about that tendency toward overwhelm that comes from trying to be 100% right. You know what I mean? Like, if you just are like, I'm not going to be 100% right, I'm going to figure out what the criteria are for the kind of knowledge that I need to have in order to do the kind of work that I need to do. Um, yeah. And I'm imperfect and in, in process. I think that helps. That's terrific. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to pair a couple of questions. I'm also going to say I have had the pleasure in other courses sometimes of teaching some of Clint's students, but I don't know you all. So my apologies if I get your last names wrong and Clint will correct me. Um, but I want to pair two questions because I think they're related and really um, imagine maybe in certain ways for one of the speakers, but I think both Heather and Alexis will have a lot to say about this. Um, so first from uh, Molly um, Wenkiewicz. Um, in your view, has purity politics had any impact on the vaccine rollout during COVID? Um, and I'd love to pair that with another question by Darren Zach. And thanks to Molly and Darren for these great questions. And Darren's asking, how have different cultural norms about purity, um, collective versus individuals for responsibility and, and a lot of other matters influenced how the responses have happened um, in different countries, um, but also arguably within even one country, um, it, it seems relevant too. So we'd love to have you both or either or both of you reflect on those questions. Maybe I'll start with just the part about purity politics. And um, so I haven't thought about this. So I'm, I'm just responding without really thinking in it, because I think that's a beautiful question. Um, both of these are beautiful and they do definitely go together. So I see a couple of different things. Um, the obvious one is uh, the way that we think about and are uncomfortable with um, stuff that transverses the boundary of our skin. So I think the whole way that we think about sickness and therefore vaccines um, and medicine and needles, all of that is completely uh, central to how purity politics um, has come to be in the sense of um, starting from and reinforcing this idea that we are a, um, a bounded surface that is inviolable, that, um, that we need to protect and that there's a meaningful difference between our inside and our outside. And so there's a certain way that so much of this response feels to me like uh, this kind of reckoning with the idea that we can actually protect ourselves from um, the effects of deforestation, um, global capital flows, all of these things, right? Um, so it's, there was always going to be a pandemic and it's just a question of how badly we responded to it. So there's a whole thing that's just about, um, yeah, the, the entire way that nation states and um, how movement happens and how illness happens is playing out that is entangled in that um, useless, impossible pursuit of um, personal protection as though individuals were not connected to the world. Um, and, and I blame that for, uh, I, I blame it for so much. I blame it for the global vaccine distribution situation. I, and then there's an entirely other thing, which is about um, wanting science to not change at the same time that we want it to change. So really interesting stuff. And I'm sure Heather has thoughts about this too, about what it means to just be like, I don't know what an mRNA thing is. Um, therefore, it's 
you know, and like literally I have people who were in my amazing grad program who really do think that uh, the flu is electricity, electricity dependent and that coronavirus has been boosted by the move to 5G. And I just don't know what to think about that. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff about like, we only want things that are um, pure and natural and not manufactured. And it weirdly pairs with, and this was a virus that was made in a lab. So there's just many, many, many parts of it. But I might think that just because I'm so obsessed with purity culture and I see it everywhere. Heather can probably help. Um, no, oh, well, I, I, I don't feel equipped to talk about the norms of purity in different countries. I, I am not equipped to talk to that question, except that even within our own country, I think those norms are variable in terms of, I think one of the things that I, um, that like purity itself isn't pure. So that is like where in one domain you might seek a certain form of like the natural, the clean, whatever. Um, in another domain, that sort of standard or value doesn't seem to pertain or you don't see it as pertaining. So I think like that's all I'm willing to say. I think about the various like cultural norms around purity, um, especially across countries, not, not being a, you know, comparative anthropologist or something like that. Um, but yeah, a purity in COVID. I also, um, I loved the point about like a sort of expectation of like purity certainty in science at the same time as we don't want it or, you know, it, that that is presenting its own problems. Um, but I do think of this um, maybe in a very different way and maybe again about the, the variability of our these ideas we might hold just for ourselves is like who in our community we think is quote unquote safe or pure and what that is based on. And I mean, I think there's certainly like community can be defined like a racial community. So certainly like fear of Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander communities at the beginning and certainly continuing now and the violence that that instigates. Um, but then also like, well, that friend can come over to my house because I think they're good or, you know, they're just certain like, um, ways I think people responded to COVID at the level of like race, nationality, geography, um, but then that are informed by ideas of purity or impurity. But then there's also like certain ways we, some of us let things in that later you're like, well, why did I think that was okay, right? It's, um, so I just think this is so complex, <laughs> like is my chief answer, but like those are some instances that I find like really relevant here. Great, yeah, um, just so many thoughts. I just, I just wanna add that uh, to, to your comment, Alexis, that I grew up pretty near uh, Green Bank, West Virginia, which is a, uh, Electromag electromagnetic free zone. Um, and so it brought in all sorts of uh, interesting sort of collective socialities uh, to that area of West Virginia. And I think a lot of those conversations that I was kind of ex exploring in your book, I was like, oh, I, I kind of, I see some sort of contemporary parallels um, to my own experience there. Um, and I think I want to say one other thing as a transition to a question, two questions that are related from um, students. One of my interests in toxicity grew out of reading, a friend sent me along to, this is a very old and dated site, but the Food Babe blogger, I remember at the time, this was many years ago, and she was very interested, whoever this blogger was, about removing all toxins from our diet, uh, which included things like uh, grape juice, um, there's all sorts of uh, things, and it felt overwhelming the number of things that were restricted that were toxic and it opened up a, a big conversation uh, for me at that time and I think some of my students have similar questions um, but in more metaphorical and in social media context how social media and the online world plays into this so I want to read two of these one from Carrie she says I sometimes wonder if social media contributes to the oversimplification of narratives in a way that promotes purism I think, I think the answer is yes, uh, but she asks, do you think social media could actually be used as a space to combat purism? Um, are there productive conversations that can take place through social media and through that digital sphere? 
And then Sophie asks, uh, and this is for you, Heather, um, how can media inspire the public to take quick and certain action without uh, scaring them so much they feel the environmental crisis is inevitable? So a very similar question about um, guilt and pressure, but around um, you know, what social media and media can do um, in these conversations. Do you want to start off, Heather? I actually froze for a moment. So oh. all, all I heard was what social media can do, but I will try to catch up by what you say. <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that question of like, the second question, as I heard it, was what can social media do to com combat? In the first one, what can it do to combat sort of purism and immobilization? And in the second one, what are the ways that we can use social media maybe against overwhelm, right? Or against um, that sense that climate change is inevitable and therefore we should all just give up now, I think. Um, so, I mean, you know, I think one of the main things that combats purism and purity politics is a sort of refusal to, um, believe that only people who are innocent deserve life and that only, you know, like to really be situating these things in terms of our actual lived experience of um, imperfection, impurity, and still um, connection and flourishing and love for the world, right? So I think of the social media escape as just so complicated, you know, like, and, and really as, as a kind of um, a kind of space where there is tremendous impulse toward collectivity and those kind of lateral bonds of relationality and then this kind of like encroaching maw that's trying to like monetize everything and make us into just streams of our attention being our um, currency. Um, so the fact that they're still trying to co-opt our resistance and sell it back to us means that there's still resistance. Um, and I'm very interested in social spaces, online social spaces that are emergent and not yet completely commodified and that are always moving, right? So things like Homestuck, things like Discord servers. So it changes, right? So in my lifetime, that's gone from like LiveJournal, MySpace, Friendster, you know, like there's, a, and it moves. So it's just sort of a question, like, is it going to be something? And then in some way it's like, there's this thing I've been thinking about Glennon Doyle um, and her books and her manifestation on like Instagram and in as a self-help kind of, and in a certain way, it's like, well, authenticity, authenticity and particularity and personality are a, a way that we make connection and they can be performed and they can be fake, but also they're still real and they're still there. So I just am always really interested in like, how can we be how can we be as much as we can be authentic in ourselves in these spaces that ask us to be fake and pretend that we've got it all together? Um, and I just think it's like uneven and never fully resolved in either direction. And that's where the hope is. Um, and so I think we should all be like as weird as we are on social media and they'll try to monetize it, but it might do other things that they can't predict. <laughs> And I think that's a good point. I mean, the that last point about like they might still monetize it, that to me is like acknowledging that there might not be a way to purify that system. Um, or I mean, there are other platforms uh, besides some of the big ones, but um, that you might have to accept a level of corruption or like participation in the bigger system in order to turn it to other ends. Um, but I do think the, uh, to this question of how can it be used against overwhelm or to other purposes, um, and this is also taking um, maybe for granted a, a community you might be in like physically, but I mean, using it as a first step to something instead of the only step to something seems really important to me. Like using social media as a way to know who and what is out there and not just to use it as the only space in which one 
is acting or being. Um, I mean, that's going too far. I don't think too many people are only being in that space. Um, but I don't know, I tend to think of it as a conduit more than its own end. And that, of course, in some cases, it has been really powerful as its own end. But thinking about, you know, stages and steps, um, rather than one thing doing it all is helpful to me. Um, but yeah, it's not, that's yet another really important but hard question. <laughs> I want to bring us maybe to a close with one final question already anticipated a little bit by both of your responses. Um, and this is a question from Victoria, um, originally directed to, to Heather, but I'll, I'll just amplify it a touch. And I think you'll both have things to say about it. Um, uh, you mentioned how fear, anxiety, disgust, wonder, and discord are affects that play large roles in eco sickness fiction. Um, but is there a feasible place for hope as a motivator without lessening the urgency of counteracting environmental harm. And I'll amplify that by saying there is such a complex conversation about that word hope, the question of whether it's just another four letter word as a singer might have said once um, <laughs> about something else. But that question about what are, yes, a kind of maybe both of your responses about the question of hope, but also what, do, um, hmm, what are the ways that we are feeling now? Like what are the, what are the ways that the, that the complex feelings we have play into what we do and don't do, but also to the larger forms of social and collective activity um, that Alexis was talking about earlier. So maybe if we can all just end on that that note, not a kind of you know cheap note of hope, but just some reflection on what we're feeling now and what that and how that impacts what we do. And Joe, if it's okay, I just want to say one, w along with that, you read my mind perfectly because I started our class Tuesday uh, by asking how hopeful my students were feeling. And about five minutes in, I turned off the Zoom recording and threw my lesson plan out because this is a season in which that is very much a question of knowledge. It's very much a question of health. It's very much a question of how we uh, approach the coming days. So I just, I love that question. I just wanted to say that and I'm excited to hear what you all have to say. This is too where I'll confess. I started ENST 100 in the fall, our core class, asking with a poll. I thought, oh, it's Zoom. I'll use a poll. <laughs> I don't know, what am I doing with a poll? But it was, is everything going to be okay? And the answer at the beginning and the end was different and complex and not what I expected in either case. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yes, Heather, Alexis, please. Um, I guess I'll start briefly. Um, but I think it's hard to reside and maybe you don't want to reside in one emotion all the time. So I guess this is like an echo of my point about sometimes you do collapse, like it's maybe not realistic to expect oneself to be hopeful all the time in the face of what, what we're all facing and some much worse than others. Um, so allowing that, I guess, you know, this is, you know, learning from Alexis too, like showing up as your, your authentic self, um, being weird, it might involve sometimes not being hopeful. <laughs> um, so not, you know, ham, uh, shoehorning yourself into an emotion seems important to me. But also, um, and this is again on the theme, but to me, hope is a first step to something. Um, I think the problem with, with hope, um, I mean, the, yes, lots of people have spilled ink on this, but one of the problems is it can be, um, you know, the end point, the place you inhabit without it being the step to something else, which has to acknowledge that the step, I guess here is, is like, here I am hopeful. I'm going to do this thing. Well, that thing might not be very hopeful. <laughs> okay, well, now I'm in that thing and I'm wrestling with it and I've made some moves. I've learned these things. I've met these people. Well, maybe I'm now hopeful again and I make this next move and like, oh, this is also really hard. This is, you know, um, I don't know. That was a good explanation, but the um, that seems crucial to me about what hope is. I mean, people talk about it as an anticipatory emotion like anxiety that it, it's always looking out and that looking out to me has to be thinking about the steps out um, which might not be hopeful in themselves. So, yeah, I don't know, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is we mostly lose, right? Like we mostly try things and we lose. And so when you look at the history of struggle, collective struggle, mostly people don't win everything they wanted. And, and we could look at that and say, therefore there's, we should give up hope. We're never gonna, 
But I feel like the thing that I've learned, if I've learned anything, is that the fact that we mostly lose, when you look at people who've done this work over years and generations, is uh, any wins we make are the terrain for our next struggle. So whenever we win something, there's gonna be something that because of that, now we can fight for. Whenever we lose something, there's still gonna be something that we uh, changed the terrain of the of struggle. So our losses can be things that open up possibilities for future wins. And our wins are gonna be also incomplete and not everything we wanted and just the terrain for more work. So that's that kind of taking joy in the ongoingness, not just of the possibility of life, but the fact that once we do something, other things are gonna come out. Um, that's so important, right? Like I think about um, Sudbury, this place where I lived for, for five years, that's a mining, nickel mining town. And it's like where they discovered acid rain. And um, it's currently being, the university where I taught is being completely gutted. They've just canceled um, 60 programs. Most of the environmental, all of the environmental studies programs, they've canceled them. Um, you know, Sudbury is a place where you can walk on the ground and you can see how the rocks have been blackened by the smelter. And then you can see like most of the places that are green there are green because people walked and with their hands scattered lime so that things could grow like ordinary Sudbury people. And then once they'd done that, then they started working on the watershed, which was completely fucked, excuse me. Um, and, you know, so so they, they, it just continues, you know? And, and that part is like, that's the long work. So it might mean that we need a different word for the feeling that we have um, when we turn toward the next thing and we say, oh, good. Our next, our next fight is here. Um, so when we're thinking about like the things that we face right now, which are world historical fights, um, truly world historical, you know, I think of like I think of postcolonial and anti-colonial fighters like Amical Cabral, who said um, we should tell no lies about how hard it's going to be. And we should claim no easy victories. We shouldn't lie to people about how hard this is, but we should claim our victories, you know? So when we look at that and when we think about what's come out like right now in this moment, I think we're at a moment where it is clear to everyone that this method of running our collective lives is not workable. Um, and I feel, I feel interested in what's gonna happen, right? So like the Union Drive in Bessemer, Alabama failed but there was one and it teaches us something about what do we need to transform about the conditions for work? You know, what do we need for infrastructure for people to be able to live under conditions of pandemic? Like, so it's, it's incomplete, right? But it's always gonna be incomplete. So if we start there and we kind of say, that's just a condition of struggle um, and we're in it together, it's that thing, like we don't, can't do it with just like a couple of people, but we could do a lot with hundreds of millions, um, but we're still only gonna know maybe a hundred. And we're probably only gonna work with only like five to 10. So I would like like everyone to set up a collective that nourishes and supports them and do the work that they feel called to and then claim wins. That's fantastic. Clint, did you want to say one last word? Just just a thank you to our speakers and to, to my students for coming. And uh, no, I have nothing to add to those beautiful messages. Yeah. Also, I want to thank Alexis and Heather for this wonderful conversation, for the incredible work that you've done, which impacts us here at Rice in our classes and in our writing, um, and the work that you're doing, which was really inspiring and just important to hear about. Thanks all of you for coming. And just to remind you, be back with us for our last Planet Now of the Spring, April 28 at 6 p.m. What Now? Climate and Resilience in 2021 with Jim Blackburn and Daniel Cohan. In the meantime, stay safe or as safe and as healthy as you can be, and we'll see you soon. Good night. <laughs>